Okay, it's about two minutes past and I think it's time to get going. Just going to mute Kevin um, just to make sure um, I'm not being Jackie Weaver um, or Britney Spears, depending on which you want to call me. Um, I should do a quick intro and then I'll run through how we're going to do this and hopefully it'll work and this is We'll, we'll play it by ear if it doesn't. So um, I'm Dr. J. I am a consultant from ThoughtWorks working for Department for Transport. Um, I use they as a pronoun. Uh, what else do you need to know about me? Um, and I'm kind of facilitating today and want to encourage you to give us lots of feedback. So a couple of just rules that we're going to do. You'll put your hand up using the little hand up thing to talk um, and I'll bring you in. Um, and it, this is recorded, so anything you say will will go out. Um, if there's something that you say and you're like, oh, actually, I really shouldn't have said that, you can talk to me or uh, Tim, and we can have a look at how we cut that out of the recording if there's something where you really put your foot in it. But for the most part, we know that this is going to be fine. Um, please don't make me a viral sensation like Jackie Weaver. We're going to have this be a nice, fun couple of hours talking about BODs, NAPTAN, Department for Transport, and all of those things, and how you're using it so that we totally understand understand it. So first off, let me introduce Adrian Falconer, who's the product owner for NAPTAN. Adrian, I'm going to spotlight you for everybody as well. So yeah, hi, my name is Adrian Falconer. And as Jay mentioned, I'm the product owner for the redevelopment of the NAPTAN service, um, distinct from the maintenance and operation of the existing service, which is done by another colleague, just to make that clear. Jay, did you want to talk? Did you want me to talk about why we're doing what we're doing now? Yeah, yes, okay. because that's that's the sort of thing you should you should is more better coming from you than from me. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we've put together a team in the Department of Transport to to look at redeveloping NAPTAN. Um, the main reasons for for the you know the drivers for the change really have been that obviously with the new regulations coming in requiring NAPTAN data to be updated. Uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that we had the tools that were suitable to the job and appropriate for the job so that um, you know we know they've not been looked at for quite a long time. So we just want to make sure that we're keeping up our end of the bargain and making sure there's a solid um, you know, service for people to be able to upload their NAPTAN data. Um, within the Department for Transport itself, NAPTAN's been a bit of an unloved child. It hasn't really had a home for, for, uh, for quite a while partially because of its cross-modal nature, but recently we've got a new team, the data unit, who have um, taken ownership and the operational um, responsibility for NAPTAN. So we've got somebody that can now really champion, you know, resourcing and development of the, of the tool within the department, which is really helpful. Um, and, and they asked um, my team, the digital service, to come and have a look at NAPTAN to see what we might do to improve it. And we spent a bit of time looking at that last year and concluded that it's very, very old. We can't really support it easily and we definitely can't extend it or really um, um, make any big changes to it because the underlying technology is, is so old. It's such a legacy piece of kit. Uh, and so we've we started a piece of work um, with our colleagues from ThoughtWorks, uh, which is where Jay is from, uh, to help us rebuild the service from, from, from scratch. So we're looking at a complete rebuild of the, of the, whole, the whole service keeping a lot of the integrity of the existing system. So we're not looking to make any radical changes to schemas or anything like that right now. We want to just um, build a solid system that can replace the existing one. But we, we are hoping that by rebuilding this, we can um, remove some of the constraints of the existing system that stop things from happening, such as having to uh, get Department for Transport staff to upload the sort of centrally managed stops, as they're called, so some of the tube stations and things, rather than just allowing the people that actually own those tube stations to to update them. So hopefully we can make a much better service um, by rebuilding it, but it obviously will take a bit longer, um, and there will be um, further down the line, um, a small bit, we hope, of disruptions. We try to migrate people from one, one service to the to the new one. So Thank you, me. Adrian. Anything else, Jay? Uh, no, that was that was absolutely bang on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to unspotlight you if I can remember how to do it. There we are. Um, so now 
you would have all been sent a URL that will take you to a mural and hopefully everybody's able to be in there. I see that some of you already have. I like the fact that somebody wrote hello right across the top of the mural. Totally approve of graffiti. Um, what I'd like you to do is there's a section called number two, which is NAPTAN is. And I'm just going to do my best to pull you all there. Um, uh, uh, ask to be followed. There we are. So, so if, hopefully everyone got need there. To get into, if you need to get into Mural, um, the link and the password for it was sent in the Eventbrite invitations that came out this morning. You should have had two. You should have had one a couple of hours ago and one perhaps 10, 15 minutes ago. Uh, the links to the mural board and the password are in there if you've uh, not found them already. Thanks, Tim. Um, what I'll do is, because there's such a large number, I'll share my screen. The first exercise I'd like us to do, this is just a quick five minute thing. I'd like you to grab a sticky and the sticky is the second icon down. You can grab uh, a sticky note and you'll be able to post them up. And I just want you to put up what NAPTAN is what you believe NAPTAN is. What I want to understand is what you all know about NAPTAN and what you think that that that, that NAPTAN is. So um, I'm just going to give you five minutes. Shouldn't take that long, but I know it's the first time using a tool and things like that. And I just want you to put it together and then I'll talk through them and we can put our hands up and have a discussion should we need to around that. So I'm just trying to get everyone's thoughts about what NAPTAN is. What what do you know about it? What do you think it is? If you don't know what NAPTAN is, it would be also good for you to state that. Don't feel um, don't feel shame of not knowing what it is. I had no idea this thing existed till a couple of months back. So what I'm going to do now is read through what we've written up there, and. If there's any questions or any comments, raise your hand. Now, normally I would have done a full welcome everybody and intros and all of those things, but there's a few too many of you and we've got a little bit much to get through. So if you're called on to speak for the first time, can you just let us know where you're from? Um, that would be really grand so that we can understand um, whether you're a bus operator, a local transport authority acting as an agent for a bus operator or something like that so we can understand your perspective. So the different answers we've got, my one was the most used and unknown data set ever because it's used by pretty much by every member of the public and no member of the public ever has heard of it. Um, it's a database to show all transport nodes, including bus stops, train stations, airports and seaports. Public transport access database location information for route maps and drivers. Database of all public transport bus stops, including. Just a sec, I'm just going to do a mute all. In trouble. So that so that we don't have the bing bongs of of, of phones coming through, um, and Kevin's phone call. <laughs> um, where were we? Database of all public transport bus stops, including GPS information and text descriptions for locality. A database of bus stops, etc., where access to public transport can be made. A database of all public transport interfaces referenced by unique code and number. A database of all public transport access nodes, bus stops, railway stations in Great Britain. Um, this is title. NAPTAN is a national database where all bus stops, train stations, tram stops, airport, and any other transport uh, node is held. Is there anything else? that anyone thinks that NAPTAN is? It's the other thing that it is, is it's the building block for everything that we do in Department for Transport in terms of public transport. It's the thing that has to work to make BODS work, to make um, 
real time information work, all of those things. It's that very key core piece of data that sits at the bottom of everything. That's why we're focusing on it and that's why it's so important. Um, we've got some diagrams of it that describe it as solid gold data because if this data isn't solid and isn't gold standard and isn't brilliant, everything else that's built on it is going to not be able to be as good as it could be. So that's one of the ways that that we're thinking about it. So moving on now, this may seem a ridiculous question to ask you all, but it's actually really important. I want you to take a minute and look at this diagram of what a what a bus stop is and think about what is a bus stop. So if you move on to number three, it asks you what is a bus stop. So at the top, we've got a physical bus stop with the street furniture, a pole, timetables, advertising, a seat, all of those things. I've drawn a transport for London bus stop, but I know that bus stops exist like this around the country. Then we've also got a logical bus stop. This is a place where a bus can stop in a timetable and things like that. And we believe that local authority data administrators are the people who put the data into NAPTAN about these bus stops. And we believe that there's two groups of people who take it out. There are software developers who build some software for consumers. And then there's bus operators like yourself who take the data out and use it for route planning, travel time, transfer time and mapping. And you need to know both the physical and the logical world as bus operators. Now, I'd like you to take a minute and just put a sticky whether you agree or disagree and any kind of definitions that you'd like to make there. Is there anything in this diagram that doesn't make sense to you that you we need to explain a little bit more to make sense about this? So I'm just going to give you two minutes because there's so many people. Just throw a sticky up whether you agree or disagree and then we'll kind of talk through some of the ideas. If there's any ideas that pop up and you go, actually, you've missed this thing out. Um, I'd also like you to think about, in this last 30 seconds, are all bus stops the same as what I've drawn them? I'm an urban creature. I live in the centre of London. I'll just add that, add that layer of, of definition. So I understand a bus stop as a pole, it's got some furniture, it's got a timetable and things like that. Are all bus stops that you work with that you think about the same as that? So one of the things, one of the best definitions that came up in a previous public meeting, which you can watch up, up, up on the Arctic channel or the, the pitch channel, um, is a bus stop is where the bus stops, which I thought was wonderful in its sheer simplicity because it, took away a lot of the pieces of complexity around an urban and a rural stop, a suburban stop, and all of those pieces. So just running down the side, we've got a couple of people who agree. Somebody's made the comment that rural stops can be much more basic, and I totally understand. There are some rural stops that we understand as just a patch of ground, where if you stand in the right patch of ground and wave your hand, the bus will stop. Um, and those seem to be custom stops or stops by local custom. Um, I like this one of a stop as a place where people can board a bus. It doesn't need to have anything physical at that location to show its stop. So one of the questions for the person who wrote that is how would I, as somebody coming to that stop, know that that was a bus stop? Is there any signage or is there anything that, that, that should be around that would let me know that something is a bus stop. Um, and if you want to talk, just put your hand up. I'm just uh, Ian. Ian McMillan. Yeah, so to me, um, ideally, it should have a flag so people who are new to the industry could work it out. But a lot of it is word of mouth. In the villages and that, people know where the bus stops are. They know that if a flag says and opposite, they stand on the opposite side of the road. So your your I, I, um where are you from? Sorry, Ian, I'm going to ask where you're from, but not yeah, sure. in the. Um, I'm from Stagecoach. Stagecoach, and are you working? A stagecoach is quite big. 
are you working across all of Stagecoach or just small rural areas within Stagecoach? I work for the central team. So we sort of manage NAPTAM on behalf of all the UK operators of Stagecoach. Fantastic. That's really good to know, Ian. Um, so the way that bus stops for you, they're a pole on one side of the road that might not exist on the other. Um, that people find out about by word of mouth or by watching other people catch a bus there? Yeah, ideally we would like to have a bus stop there, but sometimes it's just not practical. Totally understand that. Does, do these bus stops also exist in software that somebody could find it within the village to find when the next bus is coming? Or is that a little bit more than some of those places would have? Just trying to understand it is this. a little bit more than some would have however by using naptam um journey planners and that should be able to show them you know if you stand at this location and obviously because it's marked as custom rather than a marked stop then people can pick on the thing that well there's no actual physical thing there to tell you but you will be okay which is which is good to know so this is something that we perhaps would need to explain to any software developers downloading this data what the difference between a custom stop and a hardcore TFL style stop would be. Sorry yeah. to use TFL as an example. <laughs> I'm not London centric. It's just where I live. Um, I just don't under. I come from New Zealand, hence the accent. So. TFL bus stops are really the, the bus stops that I've seen and for most of my life, most of my life. Um, hail and ride. So we didn't mention it and it's been put on the disagree side. What's the difference between a hail and ride and a custom bus stop for use as bus operators? Can anyone help me understand that distinction between I'm standing on a patch of ground and waving my hand and I'm standing on a patch of ground and waving my hand in a hail and ride area. For stagecoach, that representation is simply, um, it's more about a zone than it is of a physical set location. Okay, so does it mean it's a zone where the bus driver would be looking out for somebody waving their hand? in a trying to catch the eye of the bus driver type situation for us yes rather than I, mean, I would let other people thinking comment. about a stop yeah, yeah um stephen hosking you've got a comment yeah hailing ride is is pretty much what the previous person said it's a zone uh, and can be quite tightly defined by a section between two road junctions for example but there's a, a, a a difficulty in that the driver may consider it unsafe at a, any particular point within that location within that zone and may choose not to stop on safety grounds because that's his, his right so um and also as well as looking out for customers and passengers they may be passengers on his bus or her bus that need to alight within that zone and again the same decision needs to be taken um there's an added confusion again when people get used and within a hail and ride zone what you tend to find is quasi bus stops sort of end up being uh, it happens a lot where people end up congregating at the same places because the bus driver always tends to stop there um and if it's a new bus driver he might take my surprise but um the point i've had this happen is that when somebody deigns to wait at one of a location that isn't one of the normal ones the driver refuses to stop because he said that's not a stop <laughs> i've had that happen. <laughs> so um it's a tricky one that is a tricky one. Um, so, Stephen, can you just, um, where are you from, I'm just in terms from, of... I'm now at Slowborough Council, but I have been working for TfL for many years, um, involved in bus stops in a way, um, not operationally, but from the sort of admin side. And publicity, bus cool. stops publicity as well. And that's problematical with, with the Hayden Ride, because you can't there's nowhere to put publicity. Absolutely. And... and um, so one of the things with hail and ride might be to let the bus operators know, to let the drivers know that this is a hail and ride section. And while people may congregate at quasi stops, it's the whole section that they could stop at. That's correct. So and remind there's a drivers, little bit yeah. of communication there. Yeah, exactly. That's really good to understand as well. Um, is there anything else here? 
Is there anything that anyone else wants to say about this? Oh, missing real. Oh, I saw this one and I really liked it. Missing real time display, which is a bridge between the logical and physical. Now, this is really important to help us understand. So, as I understand, physical place, bus going along, real time information um, on the bus is telling you the next stop and it gets that by knowing where the bus is and by knowing where it's going. And the, at the at the station at the bus stop with the display, it's knowing the timing of the buses and it knows that there's a bus for this particular route coming through in the next X number of minutes. And we all know if you've waited in London, a minute can be anything between one and five minutes, depending on traffic. Um, have I got that right? Can, can, can anyone help me understand if I've made some not right assumptions in there? Other quick question for you. Do your buses systems talk to things at the stops to say I've arrived at the stop and now I'm going away from the stop? Or are, are they now based on GPS? Would be the other question that I just need to ask. Richard, and then Ian. Richard, you're on mute, I'm afraid. From our point of view, it's all GPS. So okay, so, so, so Ian, or stagecoach is all GPS. I am talking outside of London, it's all GPS. Right, uh, Richard, you, you're now not on mute. Okay. Um, Yes, so GPS for us as well, which means that the buses don't communicate directly with the signs. Um, they communicate with the central system, which then feeds information to the signs. So there's quite often a lag because the the bus sends information every, it was every 30 seconds, I think, not in our case, I think it's now every 20 seconds. And the signs are only get, only sort of get information at sort of intervals as well. So it means that if the intervals don't match up, sometimes a bus can still be showing is due when it's gone out of sight beyond the stop, unfortunately. Right. But yeah, basically, basically what you said was was correct that the the um, the sign gets information based on where the bus is to predict how long the bus, yeah, how much longer it'll be until the bus arrives. That makes total sense. Thank you. I just um, I've seen bits of the story now. Somebody said outside side of London. Is London different? Because I know London's different in, in everything. Does London have something quite different in the way that it's in, in the way that it works this real time system? If anyone knows that that would be great. Otherwise I'll I'll go and speak with uh the guy from London who uh Andy I think it is who I've been working with. Fantastic. Um, let's move on to the next section. Now, this is about accessibility, which is a, a hot, hot topic. We know that it's a hot topic for BODS. Um, we know that if your bus is accessible, it doesn't mean deadly if the bus stop's not accessible. Um, if your bus stop is a patch of ground with a pole in it in the middle of a muddy, on a muddy bit of road with no footpath and that's not accessible because you can't kneel, you can't get a ramp down, all of those things. So what I'd like you to do is think about um, accessibility in terms of somebody getting on your bus, somebody taking a bus journey and getting off, off a bus. Um, I want to give you like five minutes to put some stickies up and there's three spots. There's, if I could, I would. What would you do around accessibility if you had the money, if you if you had the things? What would change if we were able to do accessibility, if we were able to store accessibility information about bus stops in NAPTAN? And how would you do this? Would there be specific things that you would need to do? Would there be a survey that you would need to do around your bus stops? How would you get information about the stops that you're stopping at so that a passenger coming onto your bus service could understand when they where they could board, where they could go to and where they could get off in an accessible fashion. Does that make sense to everybody? Are there any questions before we kind of 
kick this bit off around accessibility. And if you're on the mural, if you just click on number four on the outline on the side, it'll take you off to that section. Cool, I'm gonna give you uh, five minutes to play around with this. Um, and because we know that accessibility is a really, really big thing that everyone is trying to bring in. Um, there's about two and a half minutes left. One of the other things around accessibility, I know we focus on wheelchair users. There's also people who um, are partially sighted. There is also people who use um, aids, walking aids like sticks, etc. And there's also people who um, are neuro non-normative who might have autism or uh, intellectual impairments um, that mean that they need a little bit of extra help. So how would we include those other those other types of accessibility in something like this? If you can take a minute to just think about that as well as the wheelchair. I should have said that at the top. My apologies. So hopefully everyone's had a chance to finish. I'm going to read through what's there um, and then we'll we'll do a little bit of uh, discussion around it if there's any talking points. Um, if I could, I would ensure that NAPTAN record, uh, that a NAPTAN record actually refers to a location where accessibility has been assessed and noted in the data. So is this a requirement of the local transport authority to actually look at a physical location and record its, record its um, accessibility? I'm going to just find out who wrote this and call on you. Stephen Sinclair, did I get that right? Did I understand that correctly? And it'd be great if you could put your hand up and let me know. One of the that's, things I'm trying to... Oh. Yeah, that's basically what I meant. Um, we have certain examples where NAPTAN is just a dot in the map and there's no physical indication and it's not even a safe location to, for a, a bus to stop or anything. So um, the idea that just an at -end record should have some kind of backup in terms of a point that's been surveyed and where it's actually a usable point to, um, mm -hmm. for a bus to stop at, because otherwise um, there's not much better. <laughs> Yeah, no, I totally understand. And just judging by your accent, are you from the Scotland area? I'm so bad with accents. You could yes. be from anywhere. Oh, good. No, uh, <laughs> Scotland. Fantastic. Um, so your thing is that bus stops need to be a little bit more surveyed and that, that information needs to be held in NAPTAN. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we've got and moving on from that, we've got curbs need to be adjusted and form. I love this one Inform wheelchair users whether the next bus has a wheelchair space available. Um, just going to visiting cat. OK, visiting cat is not going to help me. Somebody here must be visiting cat. So this is about being able to judge within your buses whether or not the wheelchair space is taken up with buggies or another wheelchair user or something like that. Could somebody put their hand up and just help me just make sure that I've got this right and help me understand it? Simon Gold. Yeah, that was essential. ability to to know whether it's free and to be able to inform customers waiting at the stop or potentially just looking on their smartphone app looking to get the bus that it's free it does come with as complex it is that it could be free now and then the stop before they get on someone might be able to get on so um, yeah. there might be more to it than that like someone flagging that they're going to be getting on and things like that but um so it's quite complex but yeah essentially that's it i I kind of, oh, Simon, I forgot to ask where are you, where are you from? And I hate asking that question as a migrant to this country because it's always such a triggering question. But where, where do you work? Reading. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so one of the things might be that somebody who needs a wheelchair stop or needs a wheelchair space could signal 
that they need a wheelchair space and almost reserve it or say that they're going to need it. So the bus driver, when they arrive, can say to somebody who's in that space, oh, we've got a wheelchair user coming on. Would you mind moving down the bus or folding your buggy or something like that? Would that, would that also fit into that model? I'm just yes. trying to understand yeah. a model that's a service designer. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I was thinking of. Fantastic. That 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 really helps me get inside your brain. I promise not to make a mess. Um, <laughs> highlight accessible and inaccessible stops in the data, but difficult to cover all bases. And I think there's also, from my understanding, there's levels of accessibility. So there are stops that have raised curbs. There are stop that, stops that have markings for anyone who's a stick user so they can understand where the edge is and where the bus is and things like that. There are stops that would be okay for somebody who um, uses a stick but wouldn't be okay for a wheelchair user. Um, so it's it's kind of giving those layers of accessibility. There might be stops that announce when the bus is coming. There is a bus arriving, because once you get um, electric buses, they're awfully quiet and they're hard to hear on top of the standard city noise. Um, providing a safe means of crossing the road to and from every stop. I like this one. So this is because sometimes it's hard to get across the road. Does somebody want to just explain this? Just make sure that I've totally got my, my, my head around this one. Uh, Richard, your, your, your hand flashed up and down again. Oh, sorry, I, I pressed it once, it didn't seem to work. <laughs> um, yeah, it was me that added that, that one. Um, I think people often forget that a bus stop really is only half a bus stop. That obviously almost all bus stops have an equivalent on the opposite side of the road. And so if you begin and end a journey at a bus stop, you begin on one side of the road and you end on the other side of the road. And presumably you live where you live or where you're going or whatever is on one side of the road. So going say like when when I go to the supermarket my bus, the bus stop where I get on the bus is on the right side of the road for my house. But coming back, obviously it's on the opposite side of the road. And so I need a safe way of crossing the main road to get from the bus stop back to my house. Um, I mean, I, uh, I work for Nottingham City Transport and in Nottingham on main roads, there's pretty much always a either a zebra crossing or a pelican crossing or an equivalent um, around about every pair of bus stops. So that regardless of which side of the road you're going to and from, you can always get across the road. But in a lot yep. of places that doesn't exist. <clears throat> Excuse me. So like um, I remember that when when I was in secondary school, I had to get off the bus a stop early on my way home because the nearest stop to my house was on the opposite side of a dual carriageway with no oh, yeah. Basically, no means of crossing the road. It's a 40 mile an hour dual carriageway with a central reservation with a barrier in the middle. So, to get across the road there, you'd have to get off. You'd have to take your chances across one carriageway, then sort of leap over the barrier and take your chances on the other side. So, I got off a stop early, used pedestrian crossing, had an extra few minutes walk because there wasn't anything else. So, yeah, we need to always need to make sure that we're aware that effectively a bus stop is two points, one on each side of the road. And that I think that being able to get there easily in one direction is not necessarily equivalent for the other direction. That's a fantastic point, and I think that's a brilliant point around accessibility that I hadn't even started to consider in to how we build this up. But I think it, it it's a really really fantastic point. Um, I'm going to have to go and look up the difference between a zebra and a pelican crossing. Um, I literally have no idea of those, um, so I, I will go and uh, do some googling and and try and understand them. A pelican crossing is the one with traffic lights where you press the button and the traffic lights change to red and then you go across. But a zebra uh, crossing uh, right. is the one where you wait for the traffic to stop um, and go across there. There are other versions of pelican crossings like puffing crossings and toucan crossings, but they're basically the same as a pelican crossing for, you know, from a, a road user's point of view. I love that they're all named after birds. I, I, I think that is so brilliant. Um, <clears throat> 
the next one I think is also yours just by the style of how it's written is actually make it possible mm -hmm. for buses to stop parallel to the curb at stops by ensuring the bus stop zone is long enough at both beginning and end and ensuring every stop is properly enforced parking restrictions. So this is sometimes you, the bus can't stop against a curb if a curb exists um, because it's stuck in the middle of the road or there's or it's not long enough for the bus and all of those things. Is that how I'm reading it? Yes, that's right. Um, so even if you've got a situation where you've got a clearly marked bus zone and cars aren't parked in it, quite often the zone isn't actually long enough, particularly before the stop, for the bus to be able to pull round cars that are parked right up to the end of the zone and then end up parallel to the curb. Um, because obviously a, a, the bus stop zone has to be a lot longer than the length of the longest bus to ensure there's actually room for the bus to, to curve round. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and similarly, <clears throat> sorry, I was sorry. Say similarly at, at the at, sorry, at the far end, there also has to be room for the bus to pull out past cars that park beyond the bus stop. Absolutely, and the reason for getting parallel is to get ramps down because if you come in on an angle, you can't get a ramp down safely. Is that correct? Um, partly, but it's it's mainly for situations where you wouldn't need to use the ramp because for you only really need the ramp for if you've got sort of boarding or alighting in a wheelchair. Um, but a lot of other people benefit from the bus being close, there being basically no gap, so they won't need a ramp. But obviously, if you're if you're an angle, then there suddenly becomes this quite large gap that some people won't be able to step over. Obviously, it takes time to deploy the ramp and you want to, as far as you can, not use the ramp because the amount of time it takes for the driver having to get out of the cab, deploy the ramp and then get out again to put the ramp away again. So, yeah, that was what I had in mind. Cool. That 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 also really helps me understand. And I think the the last one of yours, position shelters so that they don't form a barrier between the pavement and the bus is a really obvious one of put the shelter on the side of the pavement and then there's the walkway and then there's the bus rather than the other way around. You'd you'd think, wouldn't you? But the num the number of times we have where a, a bus shelter is positioned so if it's got like a a wall of a blaze wall on just one side that side is facing road so in order to get on and off the bus you actually have to walk out of the shelter to get to the bus which obviously you know if it's raining kind of defeats the object obviously you've avoided the rain while waiting there but then to get on the bus you have to then step out into the rain and then onto the bus um and also what what you're saying about the, the shelter being sort of further back really the shelter should be at the edge of the road so there's as little gap as possible obviously allowing for the bus not hitting the shelter to get from <laughs> the shelter to the bus without being without being exposed to the elements um obviously if there's like a physical barrier between between a passenger and the bus in the form of the shelter it can make people particularly who are partially sighted for example find it difficult to actually get from the shelter to the bus absolutely that's that's really good thinking and I I, I, I can kind of get it now. Uh, Edmund. Sorry, can I just add, add so if you're talking about locations of shelters and things, the thing that sort of I, I find irritating with bus stops is where the shelter is put at the wrong side of a bus stop flag. So that if there's a queue of people waiting in the bus shelter, you can't, you're sort of facing away from oncoming traffic, whereas you really want to face the oncoming traffic and have the start of a queue sort of, you know, queuing into the bus shelter. It's amazing how okay. many aren't like that. <laughs> yes, yeah, I think I, th I think I understand it. Um, where are you? Where are you working, Edmund? No, oh, sorry, I'm for uh, Thames Travel. Uh, Thames Travel. Yeah. Excellent. Just helping me understand um, the different um, perspectives. Um, so British people love to queue, um, as far as I've, as far, as far as I understand. And people, you tend to queue from the flag, and I'm just making sure that I've got this right. So, so people queue from the flag, and if the flag is at the wrong end, then the queue is almost back to front. Yes, is it, that is you, that you right? Yeah. Up, yes, if you queue from the flag, you want to. You want to queue so that you're facing the oncoming traffic, so you can see the buses coming towards you, and you also want the queue to then go into the shelter. 
that makes that makes tons of sense so that there's no queue jumpers or and but you can wait in the queue and be sheltered from the elements and things like that and again if it's a real-time display you want real-time display to be at the the end of a shelter which is again so that you're facing the oncoming traffic so you're not having to turn around you know you're looking down the road to see the bus coming towards you you don't have to keep turning around to see the real-time display absolutely totally get that one uh richard yeah, sorry to bother you. Just to, to follow up on that last point, um, there's a, a one of the stops where I get on the bus to come home from town when I actually, you know, I actually go physically to work. Um, the so in, in theory, the bus stop flag is where the bus should actually physically stop. It's where the door where the door of the bus should should be when the bus stops. Um, but there's one certainly one case in the centre of Nottingham where the there's a shelter at the bus stop and the bus stop flag is at one end of the shelter. And the race curb is at the other end of the shelter. So obviously where the bus physically stops is at the race curb because that's what it's for. And it's also at the at the far end of the lay by. Um, but it certainly means that the bus stop flag is in completely the wrong place. And it's another case where people queue the wrong way because you, you have to queue away from the shelter. Uh, and which also means that the real time display is invisible if you're more than about two people back in the queue. So yeah, quite often there's this, this complete disconnect between where the race curb is and where the flag and the shelter are. That's a really good point, and that's something to consider when we're looking at accessibility and what is the accessible and what is less accessible for a bus stop, because that must be confusing for some people as to where where should they stand and where is the bus going to stop, because it's confusing when the bus goes past the flag point to somewhere else and you're like did I have, have I stood in the wrong place did I get the wrong bus and that can be can cause quite a lot of worry for people um Stephen Hosking yeah hello yes another another very good point that Rich has raised there actually indirectly and that is where the flag goes isn't necessarily where the bus can stop the reason is that for saving money a lot of flags tend to go on lampposts even on sign posts sign poles ideally every bus stop would have its own unique sign pole, pole but um, in terms of street clutter some people or some authorities don't want you know lots of too many signs too many poles um, also locations in rural areas you probably pop it pop it on a, on a telegraph pole which happens to be in the verge um, but that's not physically where the bus stops and this is very important for location data in Naptan I think because presumably the Naptan the Naptan point is you know, a physical point the Naptan points to should be in my opinion where the door opens um, Usually that will be the same point within a meter or so of where the flag is, but in many cases it won't be. Um, and if you put the Naptan point where the flag is, you'll probably find it halfway across a verge or in someone's front yard or something, because that happens to be where the flag is. So the location data isn't always where the flag is. Uh, that is a really, really good point about understanding exactly where that pinpoint is, because when we're able to pinpoint stuff down to within a metre, that it's really important to make sure that you're in the right meter and not two meters over or two meters the other way um and, and that, that makes a lot of sense the front door of the bus in my opinion where the front door of the bus physically stands uh yeah that that presumably the, the best site for that data to point to that that's a brilliant thing so th thank you Stephen. um I'm going to run through. Uh, we've got a few more here. Um, Naptan should have markers about raised curb, or on or not to a standard stop should be raised curb and have hard standing. So this is about ensuring that people can see that there's a raised curb at bus stops. That should be the standard, but we should be able to say when it's not a standard. Have I understood that correctly? Um, I think Stevens. Yeah, Ian Ian McMillan. Yeah, I mean, I didn't actually quite word the text well reading it back, but the point about the hard standing is we've been talking about accessibility, but that's accessibility to buses at bus stops. We have situations where the bus stops are not accessible. So, for example, they will put raised curbs and a piece of uh, tarmac to, sit, uh, to stand on, but each side of that there's mud. So therefore, the wheelchair can't get to the bus stop. The bus stop is accessible, but you can't actually access the bus stop. Um, and the other you. point is, you know, I think that there should be a set of columns within Naptan 
that defines what is at a bus stop. So it's not about us deciding, you know, this is wheelchair friendly, this is visually impaired friendly. It should be a set of markers and then the person themselves can decide whether that actually fits their disability. So you could tell me that this stop has footpaths all the way up to it and it's got a raised curb and the bus can kneel. Um, and then you can tell me that the next bus stop up is got no footpath, um, doesn't have a raised curb and it's just a flagpole and I can decide which bus stop I can go to. Does, yeah, is I that, think people, so it's giving me as a consumer are, the information. Yeah, there's a lot of disabilities, you know, and I don't want to assume and categorise people into you are this or you are that. It's for them to make their mind up based on some information that we give them. So it's very much like saying the step free access to a platform. It's not saying this platform's wheelchair accessible. It's saying the step free. I'm thinking of TfL and and London, um, but it's and and the rails. But it's saying the step free access to this platform. There's not step free access to all the steps to get to this platform. So it's letting me know and me being able to choose based on my ability to use those. Yes. Fantastic. Stephen Hosking. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, just one point on that. I've got two things to say, actually. One thing is about the word step free access is quite interesting. Working TFL, I used to do customer inquiries and a lot of people would say, is there a lift at the station? Um, we could say yes. But in fact, the, what we used to say officially was this station is step free. Um, the public would use, the, is there a lift at the station? We would insist on using the terminology at the station step free because it was more inclusive uh, of different disabilities. So we do have to, to play with different language used by different people there. Um, the other point was not related to accessibility directly, but in fact, my further previous point about uh, location data, and that is some stops, well, there's, there's two types of multi stops where there's a, a pair of stops or, or even three stops in a row. But if there's so many different routes serving that particular location, um, and the, the simplest case is where you've got three separate poles, three separate boarding points, which is fine. You just locate those as three separate stops, although you may want a data field which links them in some way because um, you could effectively it's the same stop, but it's just in different points. So you might want a linking data uh, for three mm. unique stops. And there's another scenario it tends to be more in London these days where you have a single stop, but you have a very long curb, whether that's either a raised curb throughout so constant raised, or it might be in maybe other outside London, you might have a series of raised curve sections, three, even four in, in busy areas. Now, do you define that as one stop? Do you define that as four stops? Uh, it, I believe it should be one stop, the location data pointing to the front, the very first of the four, um, the, the one you get to furthest down the layby or whatever. But there may be a case for an additional data field pointing to the other three spots or whatever. And that's a tricky one to, to resolve, I think. Yeah. Um I totally understand that one and, and I have one of those close by me is one of the stops that I usually catch. It's got two poles at it, but the buses attempt to stop kind of at those two poles, but the bus stop is so busy that the buses will just pull in and pull in in the order that they pull in. So you just spot spot your bus and try to catch it up and it's all raised curbs. So it's easy to get on, but it's that kind of, it's the it's London. It's a bit of a scrum to catch a bus sometimes, and occasionally somebody hops on the wrong one because they miscounted the buses. Let's move along. Um, I would make ex I would make accessibility available in more rural areas. I like that because rural travel, rural people also need to get around. New developments need to consider bus stop provision from the start. Bus operators should be consulted and not simply left to developers slash planners. Um, we there's a public meeting that we did on um, Tuesday with um, the local transport authorities at talking about the life cycle of a bus stop and they were talking about a lot of the way that bus stops happen on new subdivisions and things like that so I think there's a, something nice for us to pull out there and I, I have a sense that maybe we'll run a, a little meeting about the birth of a bus stop or something like that to really understand and to really get a lot of that nutted out so that we understand what's happening before stuff comes into NAPTAN and kind of really discuss that point about how do you bake accessibility in right from the very birth of a bus stop? And it's not just an added on feature later. 
Um, oh, there's a tiny one here. Let me see if I can make it a bit bigger and read it. Consider access to and from bus stop, not simply the bus stop location itself. Um, brief description of the physical stop so users know what to expect. Could be hard to keep up to date. I totally agree with the hard to keep up to date. Um, I'm going to talk about something that somebody suggested, which is using, it's, it's going to sound futuristic, so let's go for it. It's 2525. It's 2025. Um, you've got dash cams on your buses, and we use the feed from the dash cams to rate and monitor the accessibility of bus stops of where the bus is stopping so we use machine learning to look at that and go this bus stop said it's got this and we check it and it's got a pole and it's got this and it's got those things um that's kind of an idea that came up that, that came through at another public meeting which is kind of an, an interesting thing to consider far in the future um NAPTAN should be more than just a dot on a map. It should indicate that a point is accessible for all users. Completely agree. I think that's a really cool idea. Um, what would change for you? This is what would change for us if to, to make things more accessible, to have things accessible. Greater enforcements and penalties for bl blocking bus stops when disability something act requirements are breached. Standard bus stop heights to match vehicle types. So th this is two things I think. One is bigger parking penalties for people who park in bus stops. And the other one is making sure that there's standard our, our buses all slightly different heights and our bus stops slightly different heights to buses and that's causing some of this problem is I'm just trying to understand the second part of this of the sticky note. The, the, the differences between authorities um, the different different uh, uh, platform heights is, is generally the inconsistency we find. So so David is that you're crossing between two local authorities and one local authority has a curb of so high and the other one the curb is slightly less high. That's correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Um where are you where are you working, David? Um, I work for Stagecoach as well. I but I work for Stagecoach Northeast. Don't worry, I'm not taking names to chase you down or anything like that. It's 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 just so that I remember who I spoke to. Um, that makes sense. So, so it's about standardising because the buses don't change heights when they cross the boundary lines, but the curbs change heights. I got you now. Um, that NAPTAN could be used to define locations which must be kept clear for buses to access and passengers to use. So this is almost tying NAPTAN into parking and parking planning, so that the the people planning parking understand where they need to keep spaces clear. Just bear with me here two seconds. I've got somebody at my door. Adrian, would you like to take over for two for a minute? Um, yeah, the fun of uh, uh, working from home. Oh, I'd lost where we were, so apologies. Um, is there much is there a strong link between parking and the enforcement of parking and, and nap time? Do people see that in terms of the potential? Hi, Jay. We were just talking about parking, parking enforcement. And uh, so and then that time stops. I just wonder if, if there is a, if there's a strong role for parking enforcement, and how that would be linked to NAPTAN. I'm sort of struggling to see. I so think this comes. I think this comes into street manager, and and there's a a big interlink part that that we could look at there. But I think that's a really good point that we hadn't considered, because I hadn't considered that parking might need to be something that focuses around bus stops. And this was a really good point to bring it out. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, and the last one is our services will be open to more and more 
more people with special individual needs outside of urban areas. I think that's a really, really great idea. Again, it's that public transport, accessible public transport isn't just for people who live in the centre of the city. It should be available to people in villages and all around the country as well. It's not, it's, it's not just, uh, it's not just as, as London is. Right. Now we're going to get into number five. This is a bit of the nitty gritty or the horrible stuff. Now, I understand, and you feel free to tell me if I'm wrong, that everyone here at some point in time during their day or their working week or their working month downloads files from NAPTAN and does something with them, puts them into their planner, transporty, making sure where the bus is going type software. So what I want to ask you some questions about is actually getting the files out of NAPTAN, because this is the bit that I know that we can improve. I really know that we can improve, but I want to understand kind of your thoughts now. I want to understand how you do it, how you'd like to do it. So we've got this thing called an API. Now, for those who don't know, an API is simply just a computer talking to another computer, and it's about how it's going to talk. And it means that a computer can go, uh, I, I last got an update at midnight last night, so give me all the changes that have happened today. And it will just reply and go, here's all the changes that happened today. And I can put that into my database and go off and use, use my data set. So what I'd like you to do is follow me down to number five um, and just kind of put in, um, I've got three sections. One is about whether or not you'd be interested in an API. If you don't, I can give a, I can't give a better description of what an API is. It's essentially machines talking to machines without us having to get our humans getting involved. Um, whether you use the XML or the CSV file, um, and whether you grab everything, so you're you're looking nationally and you're grabbing the whole of the NAPTAN database, or you're grabbing the NAPTAN database just for one or two areas. So if you're crossing a boundary or something like that, you need to grab two, two, two areas. So I'd like to give you like five minutes to put your thoughts up on that. Um, and then we'll discuss through them in the same way. Um, if you think something is horrible, this is your chance to tell us how horrible it is. If you think the current system is awful and you're struggling with it, this is your chance to tell us about that right now. I really, really want to hear your pain and your woes. So I'm going to th throw up a timer for five minutes and I'll let you go down on number five and throw some stickies in those spaces and give us your thoughts about this. Okay. I'm going to start off with some of these while people are still typing. Um, and hopefully these raise some really interesting talking points for everybody. So um, I'm going to start off with this one. I download CSV and XML as both whole sets or selected sets. It depends on which d data system I need it for. OK, so I want to ask about which data systems you need that for. Um, it's annoying when you change a setting on the website and it defaults back to the top of the page. So this is from Alex at Stagecoach. Alex, I'd really like, and I'm not sure which of the three Alex's is, oh, Alex Proctor, thank you. Um, I'd really love you to tell me which data systems you're talking about, and then we'll talk about the problems with the website. Yeah, so. I have to download uh, NAPTAN files for our scheduling system, our AVL system, and our ticket machine back office system. Um, and they use a mixture of XMLs or CSVs. Um, mm -hmm. And it depends how much I need. So sometimes it's selected sets, sometimes it's a whole set. Um, but the the annoying thing about the website is if you've got if you're trying to do a selected set and you've got loads of areas selected and you change it from wanting CSV to XML, it defaults back to the top of the page. Then you have to scroll back down before you can click the download button. That that is very annoying and that is something we're we're looking at improving the usability of the website, how 
we can make the flow better and things like that. So I think you're definitely somebody that we would like to talk to. Um, and I'm going to drop my email and Adrian's email at the end of this for us to talk to you. Um, what does AVL mean? I didn't, is that availability or is that uh, something else? That's real time. Ah, real time, cool. Alex, can I, I just check, I'll, I'll check which company you're with? Sorry, I was just making some notes and I missed that bit. Yeah, so I'm part of the um, Central Stagecoach team. Thank you. Um, so that was really great. I normally receive updates from our supplier. The only time I ever need to download files myself is for our next stop announcement program, and I found it fine for this purpose. Although stop names need to be need elaborating to be meaningful. This is from David Sharp. David, are you okay just kind of talking us through what what you mean by stop names elaborating to be meaningful? Yeah. Is this it's just the stop names are quite vague sometimes. I mean, we need to keep the name consistent for out external journey planners and things. But what I tend to do, I, I have to then make the name, add, add extra bits to the stop names, which I've done in our, our system. And once it's done, it's done, mm -hmm. done for good. So it, normally it's fine, but it's just, it's just it's, I know it's very difficult to get the naming conventions or what we want them to be sometimes, but that, that is, a, is, a, is a bit of a time consuming effort. And where are you uh, from, David? I'm from Stagecoach again, but that's, I work at one of the op coves at Northeast. And and this is really the only reason I get uh, Alex and uh, and and Ian do the most of the work uh, downloading for the scheduling systems. But I get involved for our talking buses. You know the uh, next right. announcements. That's where I use it from directly. And is that and and I'm going to ask the showing that I know the system relatively well now after a couple of months. Is this the common name, the short common name, and those fields are just not quite giving you what you need? That's correct, yeah, yeah. I, I know it's difficult to, to, to yeah. make it concise and meaningful for the customer, but uh, yeah, it, it does need a little bit of an elaborating and a bit of work. Cool. Uh, so it's actually the, um, the, the lack, lack of capitalization and you know like the spacing and, and things like that as well is a bit rough and ready and it's just a little thing that you just have to go through an excel spreadsheet and do a find and replace through the whole thing just to move a, a comma or, a, or whatnot just to tidy it up so it looks good to the customer because this then feeds through onto the bus displays i think i think that's a really good point and it's that data quality yeah. checking and and improving that data quality is one of the things that we're starting to think about because we know that there's some stuff out there but we want to figure out what's the good stuff to bring in and what we can bake in to the system um let's go to this big blue one um we receive naptan updates from our software supplier i'm going to ask you who your software supplier is these arrive in mdb format I'm not sure what an MDB is, but I think it's some kind of database. The software company is responsive and sends through data quickly, but in an ideal world, software would automatically update itself. That would be an API. Uh, so we do not need to request updated NAPTAM data. We only ask for stops in areas our group of companies serve, but as we have some long distance coach routes, this means we need data for some areas outside of our normal areas of operation, just to get a handful of stops, e.g. to get Gatwick Airport, we need to get the whole of West Sussex. Right, so you're, so I'm just gonna ask a couple of questions of Edmund. Edmund, uh, uh, um, so just quickly, who is your software supplier, if you don't mind me asking? So we use Omnibus. Omnibus. Yeah, for, for scheduling. Um, scheduling, cool, because I was going to ask, and um, so ideally Omnibus are downloading it and sending the data through to you, yes. but ideally you wouldn't have to get them to do that, the software would just do it itself and just yeah, magically that's, that's, well, that's constantly keep up to date. That would probably be better. I'd, I'd basically you'd have to have some sort of system selecting areas that you're operating in. So I mean, we wouldn't need the whole country. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're mainly based in um, so it's the Oxford bus group of companies, which is of Oxford bus, Thames Travel and Carousel buses. So we're mainly Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, bits of Berkshire, bits of Hertfordshire. 
but then there's some long distance coach routes, which then sort of whiz off mainly, you know, to airports and things, which means you then need, as I say, the whole of West Sussex just to get a couple of stops at Gatwick Airport, which, um, you know, I, I, it doesn't really matter, but it, 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 it's, you just said that lots of extra data that we're not using. I totally understand. So it's almost a requirement to download only a couple of stops to be able to say, I just want these 10 stops and the updated information about those stops. So it's it's almost getting down beneath a local transport authority boundary, beneath an ACTO code boundary into selecting 20 stops from, from one particular area. Yeah, and I think it's probably going to be more beneficial to long distance operators where, you know, you want a few stops in this operate on this local authority area, a few stops in another local authority area and mm. so on, rather than sort of an urban bus operator where you just confine yourself to one one local authority area or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and just quickly, those long distance stops, are those coach stops or are those listed as bus stops? Just wanting to just oh. refine my question slightly. As far as I'm aware, there's no distinction. I think they're, they're all just stops, aren't they? I, I don't think that term distinct distinguishes between bus stops and coach stops. I think it's just all bus stops, aren't they? Uh, yeah, I think I need to go and double check. Adrian and I have been trying, attempting to read the uh, the schema and make sense of it. Tim, if you'd like to step in and tell us that we've got this wrong, please feel free to do so. Um, but I think there is a difference between the bus and the coaches, but I could be slightly out of sync I, here. I think so too, but I also could be wrong. So, you know, just to back you up in your yeah. wrongness, Jay. Um, thank you, I, thank you. I, I like, the, I like, I like that we're mutually wrong. Solidarity in that. I think there's, the, I think the thing is there's the potential to have a difference. Whether it's actually been used or not is probably a different point. Uh, Stephen, you've got a point before I move uh, on. Yeah, just just on that point, actually, um, if we start trying to define the difference between a bus and a coach, you get into a bit of a minefield there. Um, and I think, I mean, speaking personally, I think it will be unwise to try and force a distinction. Um, other operators would probably have a better view than I do, but I would suspect that's not a great idea to go down that road. Yeah. Thank I, you, I Stephen, suspect... for, for alluding us to a red herring. Yeah, I suspect a lot of points, call them stops of whatever they are, are probably served by both buses and coaches. So if you decided you wanted to have two separate types of stop, you'd be doubling up an awful lot of stops. Gotcha. And I think that's that's a really good point for us to get our head around as well. Um, let's come across to this round one. An interactive map showing NAPTAN codes and positions would be helpful. Uh, this would be used. This used to be provided by the software company Passenger, but not any longer. Um, Michael, let me have a look and see how many Michaels we've got. Uh, M Michael, can you? Give us a little bit more information. Uh, Michael Bishop. Uh, yes, good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, um, basically, we, uh, uh, Passenger, who um, are a software company providing apps, etc., for websites, um, had a um, interactive map where you could see where the bus stops were, um, and also that gave you the NAPTAN details. More importantly, it showed you which side of the road they were on, so it might it may be an idea to integrate some sort of um, uh, map into uh, whatever you're looking to develop. That sounds really good. Can I ask where you're from? Uh, where you're working, Michael? Yeah, my apologies. Uh, we're we're an independent bus operator on the South Coast, Compass Bus. Uh, we operate Com through um, East and West Sussex primarily. Great. Thank you so much. Um, the next one is this purple one. I don't download NAPDAN data because it's not of good enough quality. I'm going to ask you lots of questions right now. And said I edit stop data in our planning system manually on an ad hoc basis. The NAPTAN viewer that Ito used to provide was fantastic for this and I miss it. Richard, I'm assuming this is you because it's purple yes. and, the sp and, and the way that it's written. Um, can you explain to me what you mean by the quality isn't good enough? It's quite often we've found that um, the data about the stops in NAPTAN doesn't match what's actually what's actually on the ground physically. Um, quite often stops are not quite in the right place. Yeah, they don't have the right, quite the right coordinates. Uh, sometimes stop names are not updated and or don't match what's physically written on the stop. 
Um, and going back to what I think it was David Sharp said about the um, uh, stop names needing elaborating, we quite often have this sort of thing as well. So the um, the stop name, the actual long name of the stop is usually just, just the name of the stop that's physically on the stop. But for various things like, for example, for on the running cards, our drivers have, we need to have more information than that. Um, and so we'll, we'll often have a bit more in the stop names in our planning system than is actually in the NAPTAN data. So if mm. we were to download the NAPTAN data every so often, we'd have to go back and put all that back in again, which just isn't worth right. it. Right, right, I gotcha. Um, and you used to use the Eto World Viewer. Is this the yes. um, the one where you go in and you can see the stops yeah. for a different area? Is well, that what? You can see stops for wherever. And what, what we usually use it for is if um, you know to look at particular stops. You just put the stop code of the stop in the search thing, and it would just take you to it and show all the, all the information. Uh, and also going back to the previous point, it was an interactive map as well. That was something that was available. So if we were, say, introducing a service along a road we didn't serve before, we could just see on the map easily what stops are along that road, know which stops we needed to be serving. Um, and yeah, that that unfortunately stopped being updated at the end of last year. So uh, I've not managed to get the thing that's been put on GitHub working yet, but it's, it's got a limitation that you can only see data for one local authority at once. And although we only serve a small geographical area, we serve three. <laughs> and so having to switch between one and the other, in particular, because where, where the boundaries often are, it means buses cross the boundaries multiple times, and there's a very real chance of missing out a bus stop because we used to change from one authority to the other too quickly. Yeah, that's know, that's that's really good to know. Adrian, I know, sorry, I don't know if I'm going to speak at cost purposes today, but we we have extended the Eta World tool. Um, I don't know if that's something that's been clearly communicated or not. Um, but that is still available for use. Um, I understood perhaps, it. Sorry, Karen. Uh, so, uh, and perhaps I can uh, contact you offline and just make sure that we can uh, hook you up with that if that's still an appropriate thing. Well, the, um, uh, I just understood that it stopped being updated at the end of last year, so therefore the data couldn't be relied on anymore. That's so, probably true. So it's still there, but it's not yeah. been updated. Exactly. Not doing any more work on it yet. I understand. Yeah, so I, okay. I, yeah, I don't want to use it and find and put data that's incorrect into my system. Yeah, totally understand. Sense. Yeah. Um, so, and then the green one, we use systems like Eto to update our schedules. Obviously, they're doing very similar. Um, as we need to, this is updated internally. We don't need access to a general database. Um, this is visiting Penguin. Visiting Penguin, would you would you like to just confirm this, if you don't mind? Uh, and I'm just going to scroll up. John, Charlie. Hello, hi. Um, I'm quite glad I'm visiting Penguin. I wondered what animal I had been assigned. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So like has been mentioned before, we we use um uh, I always pronounce it Ito World, but Ito to update our schedules as as is necessary. We tend not to access things from a general database. Um, so what we do is we upgrade or update, I should say, everything internally. So we will, you know, draw through a new route, create a new route, a new schedule, and then that we can update then our timetables. And we also use OmniBase and OmniTimes. So we can update everything at the same time. Um, and actually, just to build on a point that was mentioned before, um, by, I'm afraid I didn't catch his name, but uh, the chap from Nottingham. Um, I'm the, the, the point up there that says about a good idea for the API. Um, but where I've written there, it would be handy if you could choose to update all the stops except for those you've manually changed, because I agree with him. Um, quite often we find that we add extra data to a stop because we've already talked about naming conventions not being perfect. We try to make it a little bit easier for our drivers by adding that little bit of extra information. If you then did a big system update, you know, I've suddenly found that, you know, I might have say updated 20 or 30 stops. Um, and I've lost a whole bunch of data. And um, just to clarify, I'm a, I should have said at the start, I'm sorry, I'm from Go East Anglia, which is a subsidiary of the Go Ahead Group. So we're operating four operating companies around Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex. So we're very much 
a mix of rural and urban. So I can kind of sympathize very much with what people have said on both sides of the coin there. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And I think that's really good to understand how you're interacting with this data and how we can ensure that we provide something that, that works for you in the way that you're working. This has been brilliant. Um, and we we already touched on it, the good idea if the update could reach different types of software, that's we one of the ways that it happens is we provide essentially a feed out and it's like Velcro and people create the hooks to go and grab whatever's coming from the feed. Um, would be handy if you could choose to update all stops except those you have manually changed. I think that's, uh, that is possible, but it's something that we would need to look at as to how those two systems hooked into each other. Um, let's squish along. I think I've covered everything there. Is there anything else around the data that people have thoughts and that we haven't covered? Ian. One thing that I'd like to mention is it's obviously about who provides you with the data. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's that side of it that we need more consistency on and more, perhaps accuracy is the wrong word, but you know, the elements have got to be updated frequently if bus stops are changing. So it's great getting NAPTAN sorted, but if the quality of the data coming into NAPTAN is not good, that's why we're doing these amendments. I got you totally, Ian, and I think that's a really, really good point. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to get and trying to, uh, there's a difference between frequency and accuracy. So if, if my data is accurate, and correct, I don't need, I've, and I've updated it three months ago and nothing has changed. It's still accurate and correct. I don't need to update it every week. Updating wrong data every week is almost worse than updating good data, accurate data once every three months. So it's just kind of understanding those two different tensions and how we talk about data quality. Does that m m make sense? It does and have a kind of uh, good, good. Oh, one quick question. Let me just throw out. Oh, Richard, I'll come. I'll ask my quick question, and then then I'll come to you. One quick question: temporary bus stops. When a bus stop has to be moved because of roadworks or something happens, and the bus stops gets moved, say, fifty meters down the street, and it's going to be moved for a day, a week, a month. How? When do you need to know? Is it? Only if, if it's for a day, your bus drivers can shuffle it around. For a week, you kind of need to know, and for a month, you definitely need to know. That's my expectation, but I'd like you to just kind of quickly let me know if you could, or if you've got any real clashing thoughts there. And then Richard, and then Stephen. Richard, off you go. You're on mute. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, um, uh, I was just going to follow up a thing about the data quality thing. So do you want to go to Stephen about what you just asked first, then come back to me? Oh, no, no, I'll go data quality. Data quality is fine. OK, um, it was sort of following up from the frequency of updating. Uh, of course, we we don't as operators, we don't necessarily know if a bus stop has been moved or installed or removed unless somebody tells us. And usually we just find out why it happens stands might say, you know, a member of the public might say something to us, or sometimes, our, you know, mostly we hear it from our publicity guy who does our does our bus stop timetables. He'll like you'll notice that a bus stop has been installed somewhere, or that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, regardless of when stuff is updated on NAPTAN, if operators don't know it's updated and know they need to get the new information, then we we don't know anyway. Mm -hmm. So there should probably be some kind of some kind of mechanism in or some kind of requirement maybe for local authorities when they update NAPTAN to inform all the operators who serve their their area that something's changed. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I can understand that. Oh, what I forgot to say at the top of the thing, I'm a service designer, so I do service designer business analyst, so that's the role that I'm playing in this as well as 
being your charming person of trying to manage this meeting. Um, Stephen Hosky, you're yeah. up next. Yeah, thank you. Speaking in, in my old job, I'm my new job, I suppose, from a local authority perspective. Um, first of all, yeah, about the um, updating of NAPSAN data. I've not been directly involved for a long time in it, but um, yes, uh, I've always been a, a really big advocate of uh, building in the change process. What some people tend to do, local authorities and bus operators, particularly local authorities, they seem to sort of assume that everything's fixed. Um, and the moment something changes, you sort of, everyone sort of faffs around and sort of tries to, to get the change across. But um, because everybody knows bus stop networks, bus networks change constantly, um, I, you know, I'd always advocate for a change process built into everything. In fact, TFL was quite good at that. Uh, we had a, a database which was, you know, regularly updated, regular software update, regular data, you know, um, transfers and things. So um, I think I think TFL does it quite well. Outside TFL, I don't know uh, how good it's going to be yet. The second point was, um, what was your second question again? I knew I was going to answer it. <laughs> uh, uh, it was about if a bus stop has moved temporarily right, because of roadworks, yeah. day, day yeah, week, month, month, kind um, of. This is going to be an in an ideal world scenario, I think, um, because... Um, you know, from, from experience, what tends to happen is um, a temporary bus stop will be put there by the local authority um, or even by the bus operator, depends on which part of the country you're in. Um, and I think often what happens is the contractor who's doing the work will have the freedom to move that stop around a bit, um, you know, depending on where they are along the road they're doing. Um, and when they finish the work, they'll probably just, you know, chuck it in a hedge or, or better still pop it back next to the proper bus stop. Um, for it to be collected later but of course at that point it becomes back to a normal stop but the authority doesn't know uh, and you know there's no way you can keep up with that sort of data unless you've got a really 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 good contractor and that's very unlikely they're going to be bothered about this bus stop data so um mm. in an ideal world absolutely for more than i don't know i'd say for more than a few days you'd have the data moved um but uh, yeah i can't see that ever happening um yet at the moment excellent uh, thank you for that, Stephen and Edmund. Yeah, just um, so, well, first of all, on, on the data quality point is that bus stop data can kind of become out of date and no one really notice or somebody else will come and inform you. Um, I mean, sort of the classic ones, things like post offices closing uh, or the pub closing. And, you know, there's an awful lot of bus stops named after pubs. Um, and then you then have a sort of a follow on point where locals still know it by the pub name, but you know, you've had to have lived in the area for quite a bit to know that that's where the, the pub was. And um, so, if you're new to the area, it, it has a baffling name. So, there, there's sort of that, that sort of issue. Um, and I think, yeah, I think for sort of temporary stops, I um, agree what Stephen was saying that um, it probably for a sort of short duration, you probably just live with it being. Um, wrong. I mean, it's normally within sight. I mean, normally sort of a, a bus stop, a temporary bus stop, you know, if you, if you, if you get to a point, it says on that down, you'll probably be able to see where the temporary one is. And there's almost certainly going to be a notice at the bus stop saying, you know, sorry, this bus stop's closed, please go to wherever. Um, sometimes it, the, the, the wherever is actually just the next permanent bus stop down the road because it's in, in an urban area. Um, that That's just, you know, there's just no temporary replacement. Um, so, but yeah, for, for longer duration, um, and we've had things where sort of, uh, they've been building works or whatever, and, and hoarding's gone up and it's completely taken out of bus stop for, you know, quite a long period of time. Um, then we sort of just up, 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 update the data for those, but it, it's more of a sort of, a, you know, the, lo the longer term things. Cool. That's, that's, that's really good. Um, so thank you for helping me kind of understand that and pull that apart. Um, we're going to quickly move on because we've got about 20 minutes left. So I'm going to move on to two things. We're going to spend about two minutes on one thing, and then I want to spend 10 minutes on a big thing. So if you move to number seven, which is about other DFT systems used, um, I've got three people there and a whole pile of DFT systems that we know about. Now, there might be more that we don't know about, but these are the ones that we know about and we know that NAPTAN interacts with. So if you could take two minutes and just create some circles, I want to understand, ideally use the same color all the way through so I can see, I can kind of track it. Um, I want to understand which ones you personally use, 
which ones are used by other members of your team and which ones are used by other departments or contractors within your organization. So I'm trying to understand whether we're talking I think we're talking to the right people, but whether we're talking to the right people when we come to talk about um, street manager, I don't think I don't think any of you on this call will have an interaction with street manager. Now you could prove me wrong by doing this. So uh, I'm going to give you two minutes. Just cr take some circles and just stick them down. You can put your initials on or not. I don't mind. Just stick them on. Which ones you use personally, which ones are used by members of your team, and which ones are used by other departments or contractors within your organization. This is just a really super quick exercise to make sure that we're not talking to the wrong people. And David, uh, is this, uh, do you have a comment or is this a, a um, legacy hand? I can't, re I can't remember. Yeah, it was just a, just a comment about the previous slide, really. Um, I don't know whether do you want to do you want me to mention it. Yeah, yeah, I'd love it. Yeah, yeah I'd it love was, the comment, and I'm sorry. It was just about again touching on uh, I think what Richard said as well about the the, the data quality. Well, I, I find there's, there's a there's a lot of inconsistencies with actual stop locations with the geocoding, um, and it's it's how that gets flagged up really going forward. Um, we only tend to find out with it is, is on our AVL data and sort of flags up, you know, if a bus is at a stop and, and then it's, it's the stops um, where we think it is and and, and, and it's showing the bus is showing is running early and that sort of flags up in our system because the geocoding location is out. Um, also, it's helped, I think, in more in recent times we've got buses with next stop announcements with the talking buses, and, and we have quite a few good drivers who are who feed back to me, you know, when the bus is announcing the stop in the wrong place. But uh, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit vague in the sort of systems for reporting that. I mean, I report them to the local authorities, and but it, it does seem to take a while to sort of uh, eke its way through and correct itself. Mm -hmm. That's really good to understand. And to David. I'm just trying to. Ah, uh, yes, you work for Northeast Stage Coast mm -hmm. Coach, don't you? Yeah. Uh, back. Cool. Uh, Richard, you've got some thoughts there. Oh, I'm loving the bus. Whoever found the bus, you're you're absolutely genius. I I love this. Um, sorry. I can't take credit. I'm afraid. Just... Um, <laughs> sorry. Go, going uh, going back to what David was saying. That's that's the kind of thing I mean by the uh, data quality. Um, mm -hmm. You know, quite often because all our buses are fitted with real time with next stop announcements and everything. Um, and yeah, quite often we find that the coordinates in that town are incorrect. So it does things at the wrong point. And um, in particular, our ticketing system sort of switches on effectively when you open the doors at a bus stop. But if it doesn't think it's a bus stop, it doesn't go on and the driver has to do it manually. Mm -hmm. So um, right. usually, if we find that coordinates are incorrect, we'll work out what they are and tell the appropriate local authority and say, you know, this is the coordinates are still incorrect. This is what we think they are. You know, so please we update and update NAPTA. And Richard, how do you find does that does that filter through quite quickly or <laughs> it's always that moment when someone's giving really, really good pieces of information. Okay, so we've got a couple of seconds left on this on this other bit. And then when Richard unfreezes, we'll ask him that question. But I see that, that I was kind of right that none of you in, interact with Street Manager. Richard, are you back? Ah, uh, here we go. I think I am. As far as I know. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Normally, yeah, we get either either feedback from uh, the uh, driver, or could we also pop in and say this isn't right, or we'll complain to somebody that the ticketing isn't working at a stop or whatever, and sometimes just. I notice stuff when I'm traveling on buses and I'll sort of think, well, that's not right. And then, you know, go back and have a look when I get when I get into work. But obviously I'm not doing that very much at the moment. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so usually it just comes from from drivers or other colleagues. Fantastic. Right. Just to focus us back on the DFT systems used and just make sure that we've got them all. And then I'm going to ask for your joy, frustration and anger. Uh, or joy, sadness, and 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 anger. So, um, other systems used. We've got nobody using Street Manager or Incident Reporting. We've got this thing called 
EBSR. Could somebody tell me what EBSR is? Um, find out it's who wrote it. it, it electronic oh, bus service. Electronic bus service, service registration. Yeah. Electronic bus service registration. Yeah, it's the method for registering public bus services, but using um, effectively trans exchange files. Uh, There's an electronic version. Right. Um, and so Simon and the people who are using this, is this to say, I'm going to run a public bus service on this route for this local authority? Yeah, so you, we're regulated by the Traffic Commissioner, so you, you, whether or not you use EBSR, you um, outside London, you have to register public bus services, timetables, uh, route descriptions, um, various other things um, to say okay. what you're operating. Right. I will I will go and I will add this to the next version of this diagram. Thank you for that. You're the first person who's bought first people who've brought that one up. Um, so we've got one person who 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 uses MPTG. Um, Alex at Stagecoach. Do you use Alex at Stagecoach? Do you use Nubtig, which is its nickname? Um, very often, or is this using it as part of Naptan? Uh, I download it along with Naptan every week for our real time system. Is that okay? Um, I might come and have a chat with you offline from this about why you, uh, how you're using Nubtig, because you're the first Nubtig user that I've found. So I want to go and and have many chats with you about how how Nubtig is used. Okay. Thank you. Um, so let's have a look. And Naptan incident reporting fares fares doesn't exist yet. It's a or will exist eventually. Real time bus information. Fantastic. Right, let's move on to number eight because we've got about 20 minutes left. Now, this is where uh, leech the wound, lance the boil, whatever you want to call it. I would like you to take a good five minutes to think about working with Department for Transport, working with us, with BODS and NAPTAN. And I want you to tell us what gives you joy of working with us what frustrates you about working with us and what makes you sad about working with us. This is in the services we provide, the way that we talk to you, the way that changes happen, um, anything and everything about this whole BODS, NAPTAN, trans exchange, real time, all of those things, just put it out there, put it up there and tell us. Because if we don't know, we can't learn from our past mistakes, we can't make improvements, and we can't avoid doing the things that make you angry and make you sad. So I'm going to give you five minutes and we'll see how we go with that. Right, there we go. So what gives us joy? Let's start off with the happy things, because that's, that's always the best things to start off with. Um, what gives us joy? I think it's good that public transport can be coded in a way that enables information to be shared and used in a range of applications. I like that too. I like that we can share out these things. The other one, I think on a similar vein, is ActoCode is a simple way of communicating an exact stop to others via trans exchange files. Absolutely. Acto, Acto codes rock, um, bus stops rock. Right, what, what frustrates you? Let's let's hit that frustration one first. Um, a lot of people don't seem to understand the subtleties of how route variations are numbered, suffix lettered, and therefore we usually seem to get a one size fits all solution for how bus services should be grouped for BODs in particular. Um, does somebody want to just give me a little bit of extra detail on this so we can avoid doing the same thing, Richard? Yeah, I'm afraid that's another one from me. Um, it's something I came across as a result of uh, us uploading um, service information to BODS. Um, that the the idea seems to be that we we should upload service yeah, sort of a service with its variations in a, in like so one trans exchange file per service with its variations included. But there seems to be a bit of um, uh, inflexibility about what a variation is. 
So it's fairly obvious that, say, for example, if you've got, say, root 25 and 25b, 25b is a variation of 25, so they should be in the same file together. But 24, even though it's a short working of 25, is considered to be separate when in fact it isn't. It's still part of the 25. It just has a different number. And um, particularly this comes up if you've got a circular service which shows one number in one direction and another number in another direction. So the passengers know which way round the bus is going. And uh, according to the, the way it's thought of in BODS, the opposite directions should therefore be uploaded separately. Whereas of course, in reality, they are the same route. They're just, they've just got different numbers because they're running in different directions. I think um, it seems to reflect that not everyone has as much of an understanding of how bus networks actually work as would be ideal for people who work with them in this way. Okay, so yeah, I think that means there's a little bit more thinking and understanding and not making assumptions that what works for one area will work for everybody. One of the things that we've started to understand in terms of NAPTAN is that of the 87 or so people who provide or who are people who provide produce NAPTAN information, there's 87 edge cases because everyone will do it slightly differently. And it's looking at how we allow for those edge cases. And it sounds like with yours, yours are kind of edge cases and they need to be in included in it. And I say edge cases because they're variations or, or things that just move just a little bit outside of what our standard case is. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I, I suppose really for you know, obviously I'm speaking from an operator's point of view, but ideally uh, an operator should be trusted to know how their network actually works and to decide which services should be considered a single service and which shouldn't. Um, but, you know, again, there's, that would lead to more inconsistencies because some operators would consider routes to be separate, whereas other ones would consider them to be variations of the same route. So, mm. yeah, it's <laughs> it's a bit of a tricky one. It is it is a very tricky one, um, and I do totally understand it. And I think there's a lot more conversations that need to happen um, around things like that. The other one, the data, the quality of data provided by local authorities is sometimes lacking, as has been mentioned already with stop naming accessibility, um, et cetera. Does anyone want to talk about this one? I, it feels kind of obvious, but Stephen Sinclair, the visiting goat, um, you, is there anything that I haven't kind of covered in there? No, I think most of it has been covered in discussion already. It's just um, we deal with a number of local authorities um, and I find that the understanding of NAPTAN varies considerably between them. Um, and so things like just asking them to put a stop in um, and you stop sometimes they're not quite sure why it needs to be done, what the purpose of it is, and so on. Um, things like stop names going out of date, um, bus stops moving. Um, I have one case at the moment where a bus stop has been removed because a pedestrian crossing has been put in at that location. Um, but I have yet to find out what has been done in this place. Um, so <laughs> those, those kind of things, um, it's sometimes, as I said, it's, it's frustrating. It's not necessarily, I don't necessarily blame the councils for not always doing the job properly because certainly some of them are, are covering large areas and they have thousands of stops to manage. But um, it's it's frustrating sometimes that that kind of high quality um, is lacking at times. Yeah. That's basically what I mean. Yeah, no, I can totally understand. And that would be incredibly frustrating to not have it be high quality updated at the right times and just not being able to do anything about it and just going, just, just, just make the stop happen. I can understand that. And I think that leads to the other one that's there when data needs editing because quality is unacceptable because only the local transport authorities can edit it. So you're reliant on somebody doing their job 
to help you do your job. And that's always a very frustrating point of trying to ensure that things happen. One of the things that I want to just quickly ask here, when you need to give feedback to a local authority about a bus stop, is that, do you know who to give feedback to? Is that a nice, smooth feedback point? Or is that a little bit of a frustration point as well? Uh, I generally know who the people are that I'm dealing with. Um, so I go direct to them, uh, whether they are at work or not, to, to be able to do the job. Um, I don't know about I, I I have a contact to go to. Cool, that's really good. Richard, you've got a yeah, piece on this. So, so similarly, I um, we we serve three local authorities. There's one where I know who to contact, and they usually get it get back pretty quickly. Even when I annoy them by suggesting loads of stop name changes, they usually get back <laughs> very quickly and courteously. Uh, it's another where I know the person, I know who to contact, and I have not had a reply to to any of my emails for a good eighteen months now. So as far as I know, he still works there. The emails don't bounce back, but I get no response at all. And there's another one where I haven't the first idea who to contact because I've just, I've just never known. So mm. ideally, I suppose every um, local authority which is responsible for NAPTAN data would have some kind of maybe just a, like a form on their on their website where you can just sort of provide some kind of suggestion or feedback or something so that it definitely goes to you know any any number because there's always a problem if you've got a specific contact if that person isn't at work for whatever reason it doesn't get passed on to anybody else it just languishes mm -hmm. um so having some kind of you know specific um some kind of you know, general uh, form you could fill in that would go to whoever can act on it would be ideal so that you know that stuff's got through and you know it's going to be acted on um, and you don't have to worry about trying to find out who specifically to contact an authority. Yeah that sounds that sounds really good. Um, we're looking at how we can build a feedback mechanism in for bus operators or the general public to say bus stop wrong place, bus stop wrong name type type information and looking at how we get that to the right people but that's a lot of future thinking that that, that we're looking at. Um, let's just quickly run through what makes you sad and then we'll do a quick close up here. So what makes you sad? Haven't been given enough time or support as an industry to get fares data up and running within BODs, especially given, given COVID complications. COVID has certainly driven a, I was going to say driven a bus, driven a truck through the side of everything of, of, of everyone's plans. Um, so I can totally understand this one. Um, and the other one is there is no magic solution to getting more people to use buses. BODS will build, build on Traveline, which has been in place for many years. Prior to BODS being the magic solution, the magic solution was oyster style ticketing, but this was superseded by contactless payments. Um, is there any, any thoughts on those two points that we need to consider in a bit more depth before we close out? Um, it was me that wrote the, the, the thing about the fares data um, uh, in BODS. Essentially, uh, at the time we did we did timetable data, then AVL, and then fares. Timetable data and AVL, relatively straightforward. I think most operators would be using Trans Exchange or have some kind of AVL system that they can then feed in. But fares was quite a new area, and in my opinion, probably the most complicated. Um, and that was mandated to go live with simple fares um, beginning of this year. Um, and there was, uh, well, I don't know whether anyone else has experienced it, but I don't feel like there's been much support for that. Um, and um, so Transport for the North created a tool that where you could create um, these files to, to put in there. But if you're anything other than a tiny operator, I can't see how that was realistic to use that tool. It's far too complicated um, for setting up the hundreds and hundreds of fares that many of us will have. Um, mm -hmm. So the other option is that you're relying on your supplier. Um, and, you know, we're still struggling to get our data live and we're and we've, we're past the mandated date. That's uh, that's what's happened, you know, given what's happened with COVID. Um, and our suppliers and operators have been focusing on other areas. Um, yeah, I just think there should have been some more leeway and perhaps more support for something so complicated. That's, 
that does sound very frustrating and I can completely empathise with that. Um, Stephen and then David Batchelor. So Stephen Hosking first. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's not really directly related to, to, uh, to Natsan at all, actually, but it's just a comment about the BODS uh, comment. I've not really been um, learning about BODS until you, I'm fairly new where I am. Um, well, I've got an audience, just a general point, actually. Um, it's all very well being the, the perfect solution. It's all very well uh, giving journey planner opportunities. It's all very well saying I want to go from A to B on X date. Um, a lot of people, I think, want to know what's available before they know what they can plan. So um, I'm always a big fan of, of, of maps and timetables, you know, don't, not to get too um, traditional here. But um, I think bus operators need to make and, and local authorities need to make both types of data. Um, what tends to happen is you throw the baby out with the bathwater, you give everybody journey planner data and you abandon all your maps and timetables. Um, and that's not great. So I'm glad I'm seeing at least a nod from somebody here. Uh, thank you. That that's really good, and and thank you for that. I totally empathise. Uh, David Batchelor. Um, David Batchelor from Texter. Just to say to, <coughs> sorry, just to say to Simon, um, and and other operators that the DFT have now said that this will be a transition year for fares, and there is a problem at the moment with the fares schema, um, for the results that come out and the. Um, major suppliers and major operators are on standby for a new schema and when that comes out there should be a bit more progress. Oh that's really good to know thank you for that David. Really appreciate that uh, that piece of news because uh, I'm making the assumption here that the lot of the bus operators hadn't had that yet from the BODS team. Uh, no, we, we haven't had that from the DFT or from BODS. You have to put a, a help desk inquiry in and read their auto reply. That's the only where I've seen it written down. I'll take, I'll Thank take you. your word for it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> auto reply. Thank you, David. Uh, for that, that's been really useful. Um, we've gone a few minutes over. Oh, we've gone almost 10 minutes over. I'm just going to quickly flick to number nine, which is the action points. Um, if you just flick on there, we've put up mine. We'll, we'll take this out of the public recording because, you know, I would like to have a mailbox that works at some point. Um, put up contacts for myself and Adrian Falconer there. If you'd like to let us know any information, if there's anything that we covered today that you're like, actually, I really wanted to get into this, um, let us know. We'll organise some time to come and have a talk. Um, we are going to continue to run more public meetings like this, so I hope this sort of meeting has been a useful forum for you. It's been useful to kind of bring this stuff out because one of the things I was going to say, it's been really useful for me to really understand your world as bus operators, your world as people who are doing kind of the other part that I haven't been able to see yet. Um, and I really appreciate your input and the time that you've put into today. Um, does anyone else have any kind of final comments before we kind of close out? Then thank you all for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Feel free to email me and Adrian any thoughts or any things that you have. We're going to share our, a PDF of this board that we've put together um, so that you can share it and read it and go through it in your own time. Um, and they're also going to put up a recording of this uh, up onto YouTube. If you wish to die of boredom, um, there are more of these. We've we've recorded all of the public meetings. Um, so there's lo there's about six or seven of these now and we're running three more next week, uh, three more after half term as well. Um, which you're more than welcome to. And if you get in touch with Tim and keep an eye on the picked groups, you can see where the different um, public meetings are being held and when. Jay, will this board be open for a while if people want to leave feedback? Absolutely. Um, this board will be open. There is one section that we didn't fill out which is one thing so um, it's called one thing we could fix is if you wanted to take five minutes and just put a sticky in there with one thing you could fix is on there um, and if you leave a comment with your email address or just leave me your name actually I can 
unless you're a visiting shrimp, I can probably figure out your name. Um, we can get in touch with you about that one thing that, that we could fix, but I'd really love you to put in just one thing that we could fix about all the SnapTan bods stuff. That would be great. Uh, and I'm going to stop sharing now um, and just say thank you to everybody.